and welcome to Reliving My Youth. My name is Noel Fogelman. My guest this week is James Reynolds. James, probably best known for portraying Abe Carver on Days of Our Lives, a role he originated back in 1981, came on as a policeman, worked his way up as the commissioner, and then eventually the mayor. The role earned him the Daytime Emmy Award for Most Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series in 2018. In fact, he's only the second Days actor to win that award. He took a two-year break in the early 90s to star in the show Generations. That earned him a Primetime Emmy Award nomination. We talk all things Days, some of his favorite storylines, and even before he joins the ranks of acting, he was a Vietnam vet. We talk about a little bit of that, early on in his career, his life. I had my wife Jody join us, who's a big Days fan, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with James. So, James, how uh, has quarantine life been for you so far? Oh, quarantine life. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's actually has been pretty good, you know. Um, uh, I don't really have a tremendous amount of uh, issues with quarantine life. Uh, I, I'm a little bit of a hermit. So I think that that might have something to do with it. And um, but it's not it's not too bad. Um, you know, you have your you have your challenges. You kind of have to keep your attitude uh, uh, constant and uh, but you know my wife and I enjoy being together so that's that's a plus right that helps for people that don't have that advantage that's uh, makes it difficult but we we do so that's been a plus and I've been extraordinarily busy uh, you know I'm talking to you now but I've done a number of interviews I, I actually rehearsed uh, there's a digital series that I was uh, approached about being on that uh, that will happen but it probably won't happen now till the spring but tentatively actually tentatively I think we were supposed to shoot the first episode today um so that was uh you know there there are a number of things I've got uh, two or three projects that I haven't uh finished yet uh that I'm still working on so it's actually been an interestingly busy time and I actually I enjoy zoom so there you go <laughs> Everyone should have, you know, bought Zoom, Zoom stock probably in February. That make yes, sense. yes. Don't we all wish we had? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be the word of the year, Zoom. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah, like for us, I mean, we both worked from home. You know, she's a teacher, so she's still mm-hmm. trying to figure out what's going on, you know, in a couple of weeks. And so now, now where are you? Where are you located? We're, we're in Connecticut. Oh, you're in Connecticut. So uh, is there pressure to go back to school or are you going to do uh online or how's how's that going to work for you yeah well we, we live in trumbull um i teach in stanford and uh-huh. right now we are going back in person but we're going back with a hybrid model so it's every other day um so we're going to be in person as well as remote learning on the days that we're not in person so it's it's going to be a bit of a challenge because as teachers yeah. we're not even sure really how that's even going to look yet so i can imagine yeah, i can imagine before school starts for the students that we're getting a ton of training on how to do the hybrid models. So we'll see. It's now, are they, are they limiting class size for you? They were talking about it, how that, uh-huh. they, well, breaking, doing the hybrid model is breaking the kids up into groups. The whole idea is to have no more than 50% of the student population in the building at any one time. At any one time. So that will absolutely lower the class size. Um, yeah 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 but you teachers have to be there all the time yes. that's the that's the uh, that's one of the difficult things that nobody ever really addresses yes so, you know you have to be there and you know we were told just recently i found out yesterday as a matter of fact that um should the stanford schools have to close because of another outbreak of cases mm. um, teachers will still be required to report to the classroom and do the Why? remote teaching from the classroom. I don't really know, and I don't even know how that, what the plan for that yeah. is. Because well, so. you could do it from home. I mean, if it came to that, there's really no need for you to expose yourself to. Uh, I mean, from March until June, I was doing it from home. So it's yeah. doable. So you've done it. And, and yeah. so the experience is there. Yeah. I, it's just strange, strange decisions are going into, uh, yeah. into these things, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for you and the staff to have to go in, it just, I don't know, it kind of boggles my mind. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, they, they give the option for staff members to opt out for medical mm. reasons and, you know, things like that. It has to be approved, though, by HR. So it depends. Yeah. It depends what the circumstances. Yeah. 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 And, wow. And for me, I've been loving life because I've been working home from home since March and will through the, the rest of the year. Yeah. So I, travel. so I assume this is not not what you do full time. You, you no, other... yeah. I, w I wish I couldn't get paid for it. This is just, just, you know, <laughs> it's just a bonus. Yeah, yeah. It, it, certainly. Yeah, exactly. But I've been you know commuting to New York City every day, and you know. Oh my goodness! That was how long is that commute? About ninety minutes on the train each way. Each way. Each way. So, so three hours. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. I, wow. I mean, working from home gained three hours back. Yeah. You know, save a lot and of money. A lot more time with your children, which has been very nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, I'm sure. I'm, in I'm sure that's been nice. So How many do you have? We have three, and mm -hmm. we just our our baby just turned one. <laughs> oh so, my yeah. goodness! So they're spread out nicely right now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, were they a couple years apart or uh, uh, a couple? Uh, <laughs> fifteen, <laughs> yeah, fifteen, ten, and one. So yes, they're a couple apart. Yeah, wow, you folks uh, just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You well, you got the, the 50, I hope the 15 year old helps. Oh, he does. They are yeah. amazing. Oh, that's great. The big brother and big sister are incredible. And about two years ago, we just decided we missed having the baby in the house. So. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. She's been that's very my sweet. for years. And finally, <laughs> you know, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very nice. Yeah, but it, it's been great. Absolutely. Yeah. Have they spoke to you about like when, you know, production for days is going to start up again? Yeah, we go back on the 1st of September. Okay. Uh, which is coming up quite soon. And uh, the show will go back. I won't go back until I think it's two weeks after that or right around there. I spoke to the producers uh, a couple times this week, actually. And um, so uh, we're, you know, I think I know that the show has done great deal they they really have put in place um you know my wife uh, was very unsure what her feelings were about this and then uh, she heard my uh, phone call and and felt very reassured because they're doing um they've, they've done and are doing so much to ensure our safety so you know one of the sad things is that we won't we won't see each other we we you know usually we go in in the morning and it's kind of hug everyone and give them a kiss on the cheek and we all gather in the makeup room and people catch up with you know it's like a din of conversations uh, going on and uh and it's it's one of the great things about what we do is the socialization of it and getting to see people and getting to know each other off camera as well as on and that's where we run lines all day we go into the makeup room we go into different dressing rooms well, we can't do that now we it's simply you cannot face um another actor only on stage only on stage that's it and we will all be masked until they say action and then you take the mask off put it down and go ahead and and um, play the scene and you're pretty much that's the way it is and you're in your dressing room so we'll be actually uh zooming it's a different company it's a different format i guess um that's how we will interact with other with other cast members wow have you uh, have you zoomed with any of the cast members during the? I have, I have. In fact, I uh, the other day, uh, uh, Ari and uh, and Sean, and uh, Sal and Lamont and I were. Uh, I have I have Zoom cocktail parties, so uh, <laughs> I had that. I've, I've had a couple with a couple of the producers, and then I'm putting together uh, another one. We kind of have to figure out what day, but Lin Lindsay was supposed to join us, but. She couldn't do it, and uh, so I thought, oh, why don't we do one, one or two more? I'll do one or two more before, before we actually start back to work. But I have a feeling this is how we're going to communicate now for, uh, I suspect, until next June. So that's my suspicion. And how many shows were recorded before mm -hmm. you know the whole pandemic started? We had a lot. We can go into. We'll go into October. Okay. What you, yeah, what you'll see is uh, the show will go into, I don't think I'm spilling any beans here, it will go into October and uh, then probably a couple weeks after that to kind of move us away from those stories and into something that's different and feels fresh and renewed. And uh, so you'll see that. Okay. You'll see that come on.
Right. And I know you own a, uh, a theater out in California. Yeah. How, um, how is it? I know it's probably been closed now, but it's yeah. the jeopardy of, you know, closing down for good because of the pandemic? Yes. Well, no. Uh, that was a fear. We had that fear. Um, and uh, we have a company called Young Stars Theater that has been leasing our theater. We actually haven't produced a show now for, gosh, I guess a couple of years, uh, which we love doing. And we, we are sorry not to do it, but it was just it's a lot of work. And the cost on it grew, so we decided that we should find someone who can lease, who can play within the union rules. And so Young Stars Theater does that for us. And they're, they are staying. Most of their work is done online, uh, uh, virtually. And, uh, and they're wonderful at it. They're teaching singing and dancing, even presenting a, a play online. I think Shrek is online right there. So if anybody wants to see it, go to uh, FremontCenterTheater.com. And you can find out, um, you know, what, what we have going and, and how it plays. But it's, um, it's sad walking to that empty theater and seeing that space that has been the embodiment of so much life for now for over 20 years. And uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, sad to see. But, uh, you know, given the extraordinary circumstances, I don't know that I, I don't know that it can get back to normal in any particular way until probably uh, the earliest would be, I would think maybe May, the latest probably now, next year. Right. So <laughs> it's, uh, but you know, we'll, we'll all keep going and Young Stars Theater staying with us. And uh, we, uh, we own the building that the theater is in and uh, that building's very healthy right now. We've had to do a lot of uh, little things to keep everybody there and to make sure everybody can stay because we, we don't we, we love our tenants we don't really want to uh, lose them so a lot of creative things my wife has done a lot of very creative work to make sure everybody can stay how did uh buying the theater come about uh we well we were leasing the space we had a business called classes unlimited that presented sort of uh oh this i remember this is before the iphone so we didn't have there was not a lot of internet presence this is in the middle 90s, early in the middle 90s. And uh, so people would take classes, you know, how to do a computer, how to learn languages, how to, how to marry a millionaire, all those, uh, <laughs> one of our most popular classes, actually. And, um, uh, uh, and the people that owned our building wanted to sell it, and they wanted to sell it to us. So we said, yeah, that would be uh, very good. And my wife wanted to uh, have a theater, and it, it, the, the building actually had a perfect space for that and uh, that we were also utilizing at the time anyway as part of our other business. And um, so we decided to move away from that business, run the theater, which never made us a dime, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was work of love. Right. And, um, uh, and that has been, um, you know, now for, uh, I think, maybe 22 years, 23 years, we've, uh, that's what we've been doing. Nice. He's looking at you. I know. Let me <laughs> said, what do you got? I don't what do you got? Time. <laughs> well, no, it's funny. I was actually—he was wondering if I had any—if I had a question. I yeah. But um, oh. I, when you were talking about starting production up again, what was going yeah. on? I was just curious because I know um, that there was like a six-month lapse, right, from when you would mm -hmm. tape a show until it actually aired. Is aired. it going to be that again, or is it going to be like? That's a good question. That's a good question. It obviously worked to our advantage. We were the only show putting on original shows mm -hmm. for the majority of the summer. Right. So it, it wasn't planned for a pandemic, but it did, <laughs> it did work to our advantage. And um, so I'm sure that there is some thought about that because of how it ultimately worked out. Um, however, because of, of COVID, there could be drags on production as well. There might be Hopefully not, but there might be time when we might have to shut down for a period of time. Right. So there is an advantage of getting ahead in that way as, uh, also. When I started on the show years ago, um, we, did, we did one show a day. We taped one show a day, and we were two weeks ahead. We were two weeks ahead, and the shows had to be sent to New York. The edited shows sent to New York, and uh, we had a two-week lag time. And then over the course of particularly the last 12 I guess 12 to 15 years, uh, that time has grown. Initially, it was four weeks until, you know, we 
we were hitting at six months there for a while. And uh, so I would imagine it'll be somewhere between that four week period and maybe three months. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm not privy to those conversations, but I don't know about six months ago. So how much of like a hiatus time would you get? Like on, on a typical year? Uh, none, none. <laughs> we're done uh no we, we get no we, before we were we had 14 weeks a year now yeah. once again when i started right. you we basically got thanksgiving and uh, which was the thing that so it became like a four day break or maybe five day and we got christmas okay. which was two weeks most of the time that was it every other holiday we worked we used to have uh, cookouts on the set for 4th of July and all these, which was nice. And everybody celebrated together. And you know, there was, there's a, a plus to that as well. But um, as time went on, we started shooting more and more ahead. One of the positive byproducts was that we got more downtime. Uh, but um, that's gone now. That won't, that won't happen. We'll still get Thanksgiving and Christmas, but um, uh, because the, the shortening of the calendar and unknowing, we don't, we just don't know, what what will happen uh, with uh, with the Rona uh, going forth, and uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. If it, well, I, this may be a difficult one to answer. I don't know mm -hmm. if so many good ones, but if there was like one favorite storyline or memorable, most memorable, that yeah, you, you know, I know I might be putting you on the spot. I don't know, but there, no, there, no, there's no, so no. many. If you could, th if you. Could <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I do get asked that question, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's hard to figure it out. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I've given a different answer uh, several times, and uh, because it's very difficult. Uh, uh, and I would think there are several that compete for it. I mean, obviously, I have to say the uh, Theo Abe scenes, you know, that uh, have won the Emmy for so that. Yeah. That now makes it an easier question to answer than it, than it used to be. Uh, so that has to be number one. But there were a number. I, finding out that uh, uh, Brandon was Abe's son with, with Faye, that certainly was, was a big one. Uh, when uh, Lexi embraced her Demera hood, that was, uh, that was another a lot of major one. To say. <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah and that red cowl dress i'm sure everybody remembers that <laughs> that she wore during that time and then the originals uh salem strangler you know the first story that abe was uh part of and abe was seen and uh got involved in so there, there are a lot and there are a lot in between there that uh, i could i could mention salem strength no i that that was in the eighties, right? That that was that was in the eighties. Yes, you're like you're said, probably too young. I was, I was, you're I, must you were a baby. I was you were a toddler then, but you were toddling. Do you know, do, <laughs> do you know Hall's sister was in that? Right, her twin sister. What's that? Deidre Hall's twin sister, wasn't she? Yes. in that storyline. Yes, he was yeah. the uh, when they thought Marlena was killed. It was yes, it was yes, and it was really Andrea. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. Good job. Yeah. I was about. To <laughs> She yeah. was an observant toddler. Yeah, uh, toddler. <laughs> right. That was it. <laughs> yeah. TV was a babysitter. <laughs> yeah. But, but before we actually started this, I was talking with her about, um, I guess, the killing of the 10 members of Salem. That was what my Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Salem stalker. Yes. The stalker. And the I, Salem stalker. Yeah. Another stalker. Yes. Yes. yes that's true. 2.0. And yeah, you, you were the, the, the first, first casualty. Time. I was the first one. Yeah. My own wife pronounced me dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known something was up. Then. Right. <laughs> what, how much like, um, like notification did they give you about whether you were coming back? Or did you really think that was the end of Abe Carver? Oh, I thought it was the end. I thought it was done. Uh, I thought it was a done deal. Um, and uh, that was, uh, uh, yeah, that was interesting. You know, you never want to hear never want to hear you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so when I was called up to, uh, uh, who was the producer then Tom Lang and I think, and uh, to his office and he said, no, 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 I'm afraid we're going to, you know, Abe is going to die. And you, you know, you kind of wrangle whatever those thoughts and feelings are. And, uh, you go, well, it's, you know, pretty good run. I felt that way at, at the point. Uh, I had been back, uh, from when I left, uh, for generations. So it wasn't completely new to me. And uh, even though that was voluntary then, uh, this was not voluntary. So it's better to go with 
volunteer than if you don't. Um, but uh, it was interesting. And as you know, and I think everybody had different reactions. You have 10, 10 people. Some were, you know, very entrenched. Some had been there. Suzanne had been there before me. Uh, Josh Taylor had been Chris Kosicek before he was a Roman. Uh, there were, you know, there are just a number of uh, people. And then finally, Francis, how could you do this to Francis? Mm -hmm. So at that point, you start thinking, oh, wait a minute. Now, this, this is odd. But you don't know how they're going to do this. You know, you have no idea how, uh, how, if they were going to bring you back, how it would happen. And most of us had no idea if we were or not. So we kind of moved on with, with life. And um, at that point, so the, the, uh, um, you know, the surprise of getting a call and saying, oh, we'd love to have you back. And this is what's going to happen and meet here. And we're all going to walk over to the sound stage together. So it was an interesting moment. Right. When the storyline started, did the writers mm -hmm. they know long term that that's what they wanted to do with you guys, or they were just kind of making it up as they went along? Well, uh, that's a good question. Actually, that's a very good question. I, I think it maybe was a combination of both. Uh, you know, I don't know that all uh, ten characters. If the plan had been for all ten characters to stay away forever, or to sort of meet a part time demise, uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it obviously was creating a lot of buzz. People were talking about it, uh, which was the idea. And, uh, uh, and you know, those 10 people who died were all key people with the show. I won't lie. Uh, there was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was, you know, that was the idea. We're going we're gonna to do something that people will, will continue to talk about. Was it uh, difficult to get all 10 actors and actresses back? Was there anyone like who maybe could not come back? You know what? I don't know. That's a good question. That's a very good question, actually. And it's not a question I've actually asked anybody. Um, that's, that's a very good question. I, I, I'm going to start asking around. <laughs> 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 and see who was it. I think everybody had to think about it for a minute. Right. You know, I did. I, I certainly did. And I think everybody had to think about it because, you know, the career of an actor is, is nomadic and we move from one place to the other and that and a lot of people sort of see that's the way it is and that's the way it should be and and uh so they they not only don't mind it they embrace it uh and um uh the whole audition process and all of that sort of thing but uh yeah i'm sure i, I would wager that everybody thought about it who you know there are people that probably uh, extended more consideration than others right well, what was your audition process like for days Oh, uh, gosh. Um, it was a very strange one. I had just finished a series on CBS, a nighttime show called Time Express that I had done with um, uh, Vincent Price. And it was the first and only TV series he ever had. And it was a wonderful show. It was, it, it was a show about taking people on this train, the Time Express, back to a moment in their life that they could relive and might change their present and uh and i was the conductor on the train vincent price was the head of the line uh, more or less god and coral brown who was his wife was the other god <laughs> i don't know that she actually had a title i have to think about that for a minute but uh so you know i'd go visit their office and tell them who it was and then i was the person on the train that would check in with all these people periodically so if they were in 1965 then suddenly somewhere I would show up in 1965 and wonder how the trip was going and is everything going fine so it was it was great fun I was the you know the young guy of that cast and uh, everybody else had been around for a while and uh, so that was wonderful I loved doing that show uh, just real really wonderful and Vincent Price was just a delight uh, yeah so th those were those were very sweet moments for me uh, so I finished that show and uh, my agent had told me, we're, you know, we're talking about what's, what's next, where to go and all this. There was another soap, which I won't mention, but they are on the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they asked me to, um, they actually asked me to, uh, to do a role on that show. But the role was something that I wasn't really enamored about. It wasn't something that I saw a lot of potential in. And um, so I said no. And then the role for days came up and my agent 
said, yeah, I've been, she, she had known about this and um, she had been trying to get me in for whatever reason. Uh, they didn't want to see me. And they saw a lot of people. My understanding is they saw a lot of people. I also understand that they had cast, were very close to casting somebody else in the role. And um, so she finally got an interview for me. And she, uh, yeah, I went in to interview with the casting director and he said, can you come back? Can you come back like Friday? This was a Wednesday, I believe. Can you come back Friday and, and meet with the producers? Sure, fine. <laughs> fine with me since you already dismissed everybody in town but me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. There's a lot of good actors out there. Um, so we, uh, so I came back on Friday and walked in this small office, very small office, tiny office. I believe it may have been one of the writer's office. I'm not sure, but it was very small. And it was packed with people and did the scene that uh, I had been asked to do. And by the time I got home, I actually got an offer to do the role. So I never screen tested. I'm one, actually one of the few uh, contract players that have never screen tested. I think there are only, there, there are very few of us. Very few of us. Uh, Stephen Nichols, because he was actually an under five on the show before and then got recurring parts. Uh, and um, uh, I was one of them. And, and I, I think maybe two or three others over, over time. There haven't been very many. And um, so I, I uh, got that call. And basically, the, the one question they asked when I was in the office, they said, can you learn lines quickly? And I had never done so. So I had no idea what it took. And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm an actor. I've been on stage. I know how to, I know how to learn lines. I've replaced people in, on stage and on short notice. Um, so I said, sure. And it uh, turns out I did. <laughs> and uh, so they said that Saturday morning, I get a delivery with a pile of scripts that high. I mean, it was, I was intimidated. I've got to tell you, I was, I very seldom am. I was excited too, but I was also intimidated because I had to be in on Monday. Wow. So I actually had to learn at least, I had to have one of these pretty cold, I thought, because I didn't know how the process worked. I didn't know anything about the process. So I actually worked in a day and a half to, I think, learn, I had a script of a uh, stack of eight scripts. In those days, we did one a day. Usually we work a five day week. Sometimes we would work six days in those days. Uh, but uh, I learned the first five scripts thinking, well, we're not gonna go any farther than that this week. So let me, let me do that and got to know them pretty well. The first two or three I knew pretty well. The last two I knew well enough that I could learn as the week went on. And I've kind of used that process ever since to some degree. But yeah, go in on Monday and um, do a scene with uh, John Clark. And, uh, and then I did a scene with Bill Hayes. So you couldn't ask for two better people to open up with in the beginning. And, um, and it was lovely. From that point on, it was, uh, you know, everybody was so welcoming. And uh, every, the directors were very, very welcoming. I mean, I, I was encouraged from day one. It was a good place to be. Well, I mean, I just just by watching the show, you could. There's so much great chemistry. I I feel with everyone that they present on screen. So definitely. Yeah, yeah. There is. There is. It's good. It's a. It's a good group of people. I mean, not only very talented people and uh soap opera so everybody everybody looks pretty good mm -hmm. so that's uh, <laughs> that's one one part you know when you walk in the morning and all these people are gathering around and go, oh, goodness this is <laughs> this is not real but um it's uh it's really a good place to work and a lot of very good people really really decent people who enjoy what they do and uh you know you you, you like being around them was there ever you, know, you had chemistry with a certain actor and then they ended up recasting that actor and then oh and that happens there all the time. oh but yeah no that there with that actor Everyone yeah yeah that? that that happens on i mean the most recent one that actually turned out to be very beneficial for everybody involved is um when uh, uh brandon barris stepped in briefly for uh, billy flynn and billy uh i worked really well with billy and like him a great deal and loved working with him. And, um, and then, then Brandon came on and uh, we just kind of hit it off right away. And uh, 
also somebody that I liked a lot and loved working with. And lo and behold, Billy's back on the show. Brandon's another character, and I get to work with both of them. So you know, it's it's uh, sometimes that it happens in such a such a great way like that. Right. Now, when you left to do Generations for a couple of years, and you also mm-hmm. did it for a, you know a, a, a prime time for that, well, which was which was awesome. Was there ever talk that you, that the character was going to get recasted? Uh, he, oh, you mean Abe? Abe, yeah. No, no. In fact, um, uh, Al Raven, who was our producer then, sort of the legendary Al Raven, who kind of presided over the golden years of the '80s and. Uh, uh, much of uh, you know the really house in days of days um, made a point when we talked uh, about my basically crossing the street. I was fifty feet away from <laughs> from days of our lives in the studio. In fact, Generations was shot in the original studio for days where where I shot days originally. So my first several years on days was spent in the studio, and then I went back on Generations. And uh, when we spoke, he said two things. He said, uh, well, he said much more than two, but one of those was that no bridges are burned here and, uh, and we're not going to recast Abe. So, uh, so I thought, well, that's good. I was, I was just glad they weren't going to recast it. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't that I was intent on coming back because I would hoped that generations would be running for what would now be 30 30 years right. you know I, I love doing that show it was a tremendous experience I've loved the show I also love the people on that show and um, so I was in hopes that yeah well you know uh, I'm so happy to hear that because you invest a lot in creating creating a character and uh, even though I had not any expectations of being Abe Carter again right <laughs> okay <laughs> when um, <laughs> now like there's so many different, obviously, almost 40 years on, on the show. There's so many different storylines. Was there one in particular that you just didn't feel right that you went to the producers and the writers to talk about? There have been. Uh, there have been a, a few of those. I think um, uh, one that has had the most effect on future, going into the future, uh, is uh, when uh, one of the times that Wayne left the show, and uh, I, I think up until then, um, I think we, Abe and, uh, they'd been promoted sort of at the same time, basically. Because I came on six weeks, Abe came on six weeks before Roman. They were, they were designed to be together. They were these two buddies that had grown up together and you watch the show. So they went to high school. They, they've known each other their entire lives. And they were designed that and Abe just happened to precede Roman by a little bit uh, on, on the show. Uh, but there came a time, and, and uh, so I actually went to the producers and said, you know, I think maybe we need to distinguish now. Uh, there's no Roman at the moment. This is where John Black became Roman. Uh, or was, yeah, before Drake became Roman. Yeah. Then he became John Black. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where Drake became Roman. They said, you know, we need to uh, distinguish that, and I think uh, it's time for Abe to, uh, I think, become captain at that point. I think they were both lieutenants. And, uh, you know, he needs to, he needs to be the, uh, uh, more or less the senior partner here because he's the guy who's here. And uh, so that, that had a lot, and they completely agree with me. And that has, that's had ripple effect going on through the show. And now Abe is mayor of the city. Um, and uh, that's, that's been part of that ongoing. And I've had some other moments that, um, uh, I've been very fortunate that the producers have um, taken it to heart and said, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Let's do that. Now, winning the uh, Emmy, you know, t- 2018, I think your only yeah. second day's actor to win it. Uh, McDonald Carey. McDonald Carey. In, yeah. in great company. But more importantly, uh, being an African-American actor on a, a daytime yes. show, there's not too many of them. And you ha- imagine have to be a big role model for the ones on them and then the one striving to be on them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been very pleased by that. I've had a number of actors come up to me and talk to me and, and say that my presence has been an inspiration to them. And I've taken that very seriously and I appreciate that tremendously. And I've used that uh, also to advocate for other people of color 
not not only for our show, and that's something that I've done for the entire time I've been on the show, uh, and um, you know, met with uh, some success and some non-success. I'd like to meet with more, and uh, but I see I I sometimes see the effect of those efforts, and sometimes I don't, which is frustrating. Um, but it, but also on daytime as a whole. Uh, I see that. And in my acceptance speech, I acknowledge the other two um, African-American actors who have also won the lead actor in Darnell Williams and um, uh, also, uh, oh my goodness, I just presented him to me. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, 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 Al Freeman Jr. Uh, this is terrible. This is COVID mine. We call it, we call it quarantine mine. You know, it's when I leave something upstairs and don't remember for 30 minutes what it was. Uh, uh, But Al Freeman Jr. And I was, I was honored to ask, be asked to uh, uh, acknowledge his contributions to daytime TV at this last Emmys, uh, this June, which was such a great honor. And, um, so it has been important because I don't feel television as a whole yeah, and, and daytime TV uh, has responded to uh, their audience. You know, their audience looks like America. And uh, the largest audience per capita, the largest audience of daytime television per capita has for many years been the African-American audience. Many years. And Generations was an attempt by NBC to respond to that to some degree, but we ran into the same old uh, roadblocks that can't be described in any other way as, but as uh, systematic racism and that several key markets uh, wouldn't carry the show. They simply wouldn't carry the show. And, and for the show to survive, they needed, they needed those numbers. They needed those markets. And they weren't on the South. So uh, at all, uh, some of them, the places you would expect, uh, Boston didn't carry the show, uh, other places. Um, and that, that, was, that was disappointing. That was very disappointing. And uh, I, I wonder what the difference might be today. Uh, and uh, if, if that would be different at all. But it, it's been very important to me and very important over time. And I'm, I'm pleased uh, with the show now and that we're, we're uh, making strides. There was a, a time where the show, I think a third of the cast at one point, a couple years ago was about a, a third people of color. Those numbers sadly have dropped, but I think they're going back up. I know that I, uh, A. Martinez is coming back on the show, which I think is good and exciting. Wonderful actor, been a free friend of mine for years since he was on Santa Barbara. And I was on day, Santa Barbara was on the old day stage uh, mm-hmm. as well. So that stage has a lot of history to it. And um, uh, he's coming back. Uh, there, may, there will be some other people too. I won't, I won't say who or what, but uh, those numbers will grow. Will Theo ever be returning? To uh, I probably should give a no comment. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there we hope so let me say we hope so we hope so okay great now even before you started acting you had like an interesting life um and acting was not even you know probably a thought in, in your life um let's start with getting um i guess i'm listening in the marines and yes vietnam and that's you know great you know awesome thank you for your service but um, what was that experience like actually enlisting and going through, you know, infantry training and then actually going to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sound like you were in the Marines. You knew about infantry training. A lot of people don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in the Marines is mandatory. It's mandatory. Right. Every, every branch of circuit service has their own thing, but in the Marine Corps, everybody's a rifleman. Everyone's a rifleman. Um, it was, it was, it was, uh, interesting. Um, I was three days out of, I enlisted actually in February of my senior year. And, uh, uh, and it was, they had a program they called the buddy program. You'd list with a friend of yours. And even though I went to a very small high school, the guy enlisted with, we weren't buddies necessarily, but you know, everybody's fairly friendly. So we both 
I said, hey, you want to join the Marine Corps? <laughs> like a lark, like most 16, 17-year-olds. Uh, so I was three days out of high school, three days after graduation. And uh, my first plane ride was to uh, San Diego. Uh, listed I had to go to Kansas City and do the oath and uh, all of that. I'm about 60 miles west of Kansas City, a little small farm town at that time, about 800 people. Uh, so I was, I knew nothing of the world. I mean, you could really say that I knew nothing of the world. <laughs> and uh, I, read, I read a lot, right? So my knowledge of the world was, uh, was through books, uh, television, film, and my own imagination. <laughs> and uh, sometimes the imagination took the largest, larger role in that. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was fascinating. And I knew a lot about the Marine Corps. I, I love reading history and I read a lot of history then. I actually had thought about applying to Annapolis, but I didn't. And um, uh, I had thought about going to college to play football. You notice I didn't say study. Right. And uh, so, <laughs> and, uh, but I knew that would probably not work at that time in my life somehow, instinctively. And um, so, you know, landing there and going to boot camp and uh, uh, the first thing I remember is they, uh, they gave us all, I think there were about maybe 12 of us from that area, that Kansas City area that were flying out that day. And they gave you a, a manila folder, they gave me a manila folder because uh, they just said, here, you, you, you take this, you're, you're in charge of these boys. <laughs> I know. So anyway, I, I took it semi-seriously. And uh, so uh, we're at the airport in San Diego, second airport I've ever seen in my life. Getting on the plane was the first airport. So I don't know where to do or what to do. <laughs> so we're standing there and uh, this guy comes in, obviously a DI, had the Smokey the Bear hat on and, <laughs> and uh, obviously the DI and he comes in, he's very, very nice, great looking, great build. And he walks over and said, uh, are you boys here for the Marine Corps? And uh, we all said, yes, yes, we are. And he says, get the F <laughs> outside. Right. He had spoken his last kind word. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so three months and uh, um, for boot camp in those days, it was 12 weeks. I think it, I think it still is a 12 week course. Uh, they had lowered it during Vietnam. They had knocked it back, I think, at some point to eight weeks, which was unfortunate. And I think the Marine Corps realized that at some point that it was, you know, and, and as difficult as boot camp was, and believe me, boot camp was tough. Um, I, I still understand the value of boot camp and also the value of the longer boot camp. I, I understand that. Now, you enlisted before, or were you going to be drafted if you didn't enlist? No, 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 no. I wanted to enlist. I was very, uh, very... Uh, I even had the Marine Club when I was like 10 years old. I formed the Marine Club. We'd all get together and fight fake battles and all that sort of thing. And uh, so, no, I was, I, was, I was up for it. That was part of the uh, – I didn't have a, a, what you call a life plan. I had life dreams. And uh, uh, so that kind of fit. And it turned out these many years later, looking back on it, I wasn't always a fan of having done that. Uh, there, were, there were times because of the nature of the war – and that sort of thing that I, I grew to be against. But so there were times that I was not, uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the thing to do. And, and the experience of the war, war is not, not fun for anybody. Uh, that was, uh, that was, especially when you're young, especially when you have had little real world, world experience, you know, you're really being tossed into the worst environment that human beings can be tossed into. And it's, uh, it's a pretty horrible, horrible experience. It can be a really horrible experience. So, uh, so there were moments throughout time where, you know, you're questioning things, you're, you're going through that. Uh, as, as life went on, I began to, to embrace it more and more and understood what role it had played in my life. And it's about, it's also, it's, it's, it's negatives. There, there were negatives and, uh, um, but there were positives as well. And I learned that the uh, that you have to work on making each one coexist with the other, and and take those values and apply them to your life. And and there were many. I'm very grateful to the Marine Corps for a great deal.
when you returned, uh, was it easy for you to adjust to get civilian life? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, um, from the fact that I was still very, you know, I was in and out before I was 20 years old. I was 17 when I went in. So, um, so I was a very young man and uh, or old boy however you want to look at it probably old boy would have bothered me more at, at that time than young man because the maturity gene hadn't opened up yet right. <laughs> i'm still waiting for that app to open yeah. so that didn't happen for a while but even with all those uh, experiences and, and having been in combat and all of that it doesn't guarantee uh guarantee that you're growing up it just guarantees that you you've seen a little bit more of life than some people have and um uh, yeah, but also, it wasn't, not being fully mature wasn't a horrible thing either. It was a good time, 60s, to, uh, <laughs> to do that. And, um, uh, and I, uh, you know, I did go to college when I got out at GI Bill, which was fantastic. And, um, but I, I had to deal with it. I, I did find myself being, uh, you know, I got involved in, in some fights that I probably shouldn't have or wouldn't have otherwise you, you you're turning you know you have to remember i think i think the military is doing a much better job of it today but um you know you're leaving a war zone and the next minute you're you're home right and um uh there's no transition in between and there's nobody that, that comes in between and says you know you know you have to think about this this is going to happen this this world that this civilian world that you never really were part of anyway because you were a child, so you never really got to experience being a grown up in the civilian world, so you know there's there's there was none of that there was none to ease you back and I think there are other people that could probably speak to it uh, with much more clarity than I can, but I was able to uh, kind of exist in that duality, and I knew that uh, that aggression sometimes fueled by a little too much alcohol uh, <laughs> would, <laughs> was not a good thing to do. And uh, so, um, and, and I found that there were other interests, you know, becoming an actor was one of those uh, that I had. And um, so, so I was able to kind of move into life that way. I'm, I'm very thankful uh, that, um, actually I did go to college pretty quickly after I got out. And there were other, there were other military people in the college and I met some of them. And uh, we, we actually formed a veterans club I've always formed clubs and things wherever I've been. So that's sort of in my DNA that I, for whatever reason, right. I'm organizing people in groups and clubs. But um, so we, we uh, had a, a veterans organization, uh, which had a variety of veterans from across the campus and, and a variety of political point, point of views. That was the point uh, for people who had a shared experience, but also had different things that might be guiding their lives. And uh, uh, so I, I think that helped me a lot. And then also discovering fairly quickly, uh, the theater, which allowed me to put things in another place and move myself in a different direction that demanded, demanded different skills. <laughs> so you also were a theater critic, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that got me in the Marine Corps was that the recruiter lied to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> another valuable thing, as it turns out, <laughs> another really good thing. Um, no, I, I, uh, one of the many things I dreamed about doing because I was such a reader, I was an extraordinary, I loved to read. I, I was born with asthma and uh, I had it very severely and almost died a few times when I was a baby. And um, so as I moved through life, uh, asthma was a very real part. Severe asthma was a real part of my life. And so we didn't have cable. So I read a lot. Uh, well, I saw TV too, but you only had three channels and it went off in the night. But I read a lot. So um, uh, I have a love for reading very early and I was able to learn to read very early. Uh, and uh, so when I went to the uh, recruiter, I said, you know, I really want to be a writer. And I think, and that was another driving force for joining the Marine Corps because I thought that experience would help me as a writer. Right. And, uh, and he said, oh, you can do that. You can do that in the Marine Corps. Well, it wasn't exactly true. You, you could do that, but you, there were things, there were a couple of hoops you had to jump through first. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, so by, when I went, first went to boot camp, they give you an aptitude test. And they also ask you to write on the top of the test, there were certain occupation specialties, MOS, military occupation specialties. And, um, and one of those happened to be information services, which was journalism. And I thought, oh, perfect. And so I wrote that on top of my test. Turns out that I got a really high score on the test. And I got my choice of occupation specialties, which was journalism. And um, so I became a journalist in my first duty station. Again, this, this good fortune that seemed to have been with me through my life, uh, which makes me most of the time optimistic. And um, uh, I became a journalist when I uh, worked in Hawaii, uh, which was a good proving ground and breeding ground and did feature stories. And, you know, for everything from captions to feature stories. And then went to Vietnam where it, essentially I became uh, a combat correspondent and uh, would write stories not only for uh, the local paper, which was the Sea Tiger, but Leatherneck and sometimes Stars and Stripes and sometimes civilian papers would pick them up. Uh, so I actually did, did become a writer in the Marine Corps. And uh, uh, so when I, uh, eventually got out and went to college. Uh, GI Bill was great, but it didn't pay all the bills. So <laughs> I needed a job and I was doing all those little temporary things that, that people do. And um, then I thought, you know what? Uh, and the more I got into theater, this is something that it didn't happen immediately when I went to college, but the more I got into theater, the more expert I thought it was. I had already done a play, my goodness. <laughs> I knew exactly what I was talking about. Um, but I had done a play. My second play I actually produced and directed. And uh, the local paper there had, had a critic that was sort of, you know, everybody did well and they showed up and it, it was beautiful and lovely. And I thought, well, this isn't much of a, <laughs> this isn't much of a review. <laughs> so I actually walked into the newspaper and said, you know, you need a critic. And um, uh, I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm a journalist. I was in uh, the Marine Corps. Here's my book and you can see what I've written you can see that I write and uh, they said well you know what um, there's a play so I used to Topeka Kansas so uh, there was a play that night the traveling Broadway show and why don't you go review it you just have to come back here right away because our deadline I don't know what it was midnight I guess uh, at that time so you have to come back here and type it up and give it to us so you'll have about 15 minutes well I been you know, a combat correspondent so that was piece of cake and uh so i did wrote it up great response from the uh editors and the publisher R nice response from the audience the crowd and um so i that that's how i stepped into that role and that expanded as time went on uh later on i moved to colorado springs to be part of a theater that i ended up running and that theater failed, actually. Ultimately, I was sort of in charge of lowering it in the grave. I'd been hired basically to shut it down. I needed a job. So I did the same thing again. I walked into the Colorado Springs Sun and said, hey, you need a critic. <laughs> I can do that job. And uh, they hired me. And I, eventually, I wrote a column for the Sun. And eventually, I, I edited a magazine, a monthly magazine called The, the Peak which was kind of a, a, a business literary magazine, if you can imagine such a thing. So, you know, uh, it pays off sometimes to acquire a little bit of knowledge and think you know more <laughs> than you really do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> was, was that something that you, you wanted to pursue after that? Just, you know, keep, keep writing, being a reviewer? or then... I, I liked writing. I didn't like deadlines. I'm, I'm pretty horrible <laughs> at deadlines. Yeah. Um, uh, I got back to you pretty quickly. Usually, usually I procrastinate a right. couple more <laughs> weeks. <laughs> Procrastination has been a constant battle. Yeah, us too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I try to give myself like a week deadline to do each each show, and it's you know sometimes it's tough. It's tough. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But if I pass it, it's like I'm the only one who knows about it. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's not like it's. I'm getting paid for this, so it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah when it's up, when you give yourself a deadline, that's uh, you can also move it down the road a little bit yeah. easier. Right, <laughs> absolutely. But now I'm sure you've encountered this with you know interesting fans who may approach mm -hmm. you 
and think that you're actually Abe Carver. <laughs> oh, yeah. To you? Oh, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. There used to be a woman uh, years ago. Uh, I'm, I, I have a feeling she's probably not with us anymore, but uh, she would send me tapes of the show every week, not just one tape. She'd send three or four. She'd pretty much send me every show right. in the mail every week because she wanted me to know as Abe Carver. She wanted Abe Carver to know what everybody else is going is doing in town so he could take right. care of it. Oh, wow. He could handle it. So, yes, that does happen. <laughs> wow. Have there been any <laughs> stories on set about other people's, like, uh, fantasy? There are a lot of people, yeah. There, there are a lot of people uh, that, you know, you see, it's interesting. I think people, uh, although you couldn't prove it by the internet, but I think people are a little bit, a little bit more uh, uh, reality-based these days some, somehow. Um, it used to be if you were the bad person on, on the show, particularly if you were the bad woman, uh, they, uh, the fans would believe you were the bad woman. And there are a lot of shows about the women back, certainly back in the eighties when I started, uh, you know, they would be attacked, uh, verbally at least. Sometimes you'd be afraid, uh, physically, uh, by people who really did hate them and thought they were evil and thought they were bad. That happened more than a few times. Uh, Brenda Manet, who, uh, was a lovely, wonderful woman. I don't know if you remember her. Years ago, she was on the show. She was there when I uh, first started, and we became good friends. Uh, and she played one of the, uh, you know, the bad characters. <laughs> and uh, the uh, and she would get it a lot. She would get it. She would often talk about how how uh, she was. It, it made her sad. It just made her made her sad. And uh, uh, you have that where people. People confuse the roles. And sometimes they do it on the other side. You know, Abe is sort of, as people have said, the moral center of, of Salem and Days of Our Lives. But, you know, sometimes people make requests that, uh, you know, I am not going to do. But they think <laughs> that I will because Abe's such a good guy. Right. Well, you're not dealing with Abe. You're dealing with me. <laughs> I'm not as good a guy as Abe is. Uh, so that, that happens. Wow. But before I let you go, I have to ask you about, it was a small cameo, but my favorite show is Seinfeld. Oh, played, yes. The, the chemical bank manager. And yeah. Yeah. Were, were you on days during that? Or was that? I was. Okay. No, I was on days during that. Yeah. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I missed, I've actually missed out on uh, a number of shows um, that, that good roles. I, you know, I won't say every show was not great, but the roles that I was asked to do were pretty good. But because of our shooting schedule, just right. couldn't do them. And something it's actually interestingly it's easier to do a show now than it used to be because we had so much downtime now or we used to probably won't be this co coming year but um the uh but you know show usually keeps you busy some of the time sometimes you're thinking ah, i need to go to work here sometime pretty soon uh that was fun to do it was great fun obviously uh, an iconic show one of the great comedies of, of television history and it was it was very fun to do i was curious to see how it worked curious to see how it went together I, w I would have spent more time getting to know larry david had i known how uh, what he was going to do later right but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, now you know they all had their thing to do too and they're carrying a show and i know how that is um uh it, it's a very it's a lot of hard work when you're carrying a show it's it's a, a lot of hard work even on uh, a show like ours where you have several lead actors you know when that individual episode happens which happens to all of us a number of times every year uh you know it's 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 very hard work doing that and making sure everything's in place you must be looking at the kids the baby must have woken up <laughs> yeah no, I, just, uh, I better say there's a hockey game on i just took a quick ah, <laughs> ah. i you, know i'm enjoying the nba being back i'm enjoying the bubble yeah, it's it's worked out pretty well for, for both. Yeah. Sports. Yeah. I mean, well, it's worked out well for the NBA and, and hockey seems to be doing well. The bubble sports, as you say, are uh, doing OK. Baseball, I think everybody knew they were going to make a mess of it. And they did. They didn't disappoint. Right. And I think uh, I think the NFL is going to make a mess of it. Yeah. True. Yeah. 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 They already uh, postponed the Big, tw Big Ten. The, the Big Ten just postponed the back Pac-12 yeah. will undoubtedly postpone. Right. And, um, you know, I personally and I hate I, I understand uh, from I understand from the kids standpoint, because very few of those kids are going to go pro. So uh, if you're a senior in college, you're done. Yeah. I mean, I, if the NCAA 
does the right thing. And they don't very often. Uh, they, they will give those kids an extra year, maybe in two years of eligibility. Yeah, I, I certainly you know. What? Yeah. 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 And, and even the, the previous seniors and, uh, and the college basketball who missed out on March Madness, hopefully they'll get yes. the eligibility. My Jayhawks would have won this year. We would have won. They, they, they had a they had a good uh, they had a good team. Yeah, yeah. This was the year. Yeah. <laughs> Hate football to say that to you, you UConn fans. <laughs> no, no. I'm a basketball wise, St. John's, and they 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 ah. won for years. But uh, yeah. Well, you know, every, there's always another year. That's the beauty of sports. Yes, you know? yes, sir. Well, St. John's had a real heyday. I, Kansas has, has played St. John's a lot, and yeah. in the past, and the, you know, St. John's is a historic yeah. basketball school, but uh, back in the days when New York City was sort of the center of basketball spot for basketball players, it kept St. John's and some of those other schools up. But now you've got, uh, you know, California obviously has a lot of Texas. Uh, you know, it's all over the country. Yeah. Different places. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But James, this was a treat for, for both of yes, us. We thank really you so appreciate much. it. Oh, well, very welcome. And it's nice to see both of you. You're very nice people. And I enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, us too. Um, are you going to have to shave the beard when you go back to days? <laughs> uh, I'm debating that right now. It all depends on what the scripts are, right? At the moment. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It depends when I get a, I haven't gotten a script. I probably won't get one for a couple more weeks, but uh, I'll see what, see where that leads. You know, I'm prepared to shave it, so. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. I just have to heal all those little bumps that I have a feeling they're under there somewhere. Yeah. That's for uh, <laughs> But yeah, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yeah. You guys take care of yourselves. You too. Thank you. You too. Enjoy those kids. Enjoy those kids. We will. We got to put one to bed soon. <laughs> okay. All right. Downstairs and see what's going on because I heard him crying before. Aha. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh -huh. I thought so. Yeah. I thought so. All well, right. good to see you. We'll talk again sometime. Thank Definitely you. appreciate it. Take care. All right. Bye bye, bye, -bye now. So long. And a special thanks to James for joining me today. You can follow him on Twitter at Jade Reynolds James. And if you have a guest suggestion, you can hit me up on Twitter at the first and all one nine or like the page Loving My Youth on Facebook. You can go to iTunes, check out all the past episodes we've had. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Don't have iTunes? Not a problem. The show's on SoundCloud. It's also on Podbean. And go to livingmyyouth.threadless.com for all your merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, phone cases, onesies. They're all there. A new episode comes out every week. Be safe, everybody. We'll see you next week.